Welcome back, everyone, to another exciting episode on Monday. Hopefully, you all had a lovely weekend. I want to give a congratulatory shout out to friend and One Shot Network overlord James D'Amato, who got <laughs> married to the incomparable Mel Fox this weekend. Uh, you two are both incredible people who inspire me and have been endlessly supportive both in the podcasting and RPG world and in life in general. I am really lucky to call them my friends and Ryan and I want to wish them every happiness because they deserve to have all of them. Every single one ever. All the happinesses. (laughs) Forever and ever. Well, that's really awesome. I'm really proud of you guys and I am looking forward to your journey together in this new life. That's awesome. Hey, folks, it's still International Podcast Month for the entire month. Please check out all the cool stuff that has been released so far. They've got audio dramas, actual plays, blog posts, micro reviews, all sorts of fun little things. There's even a haiku. You might even recognize some familiar voices. Uh, You can hear everything at internationalpodcastmonth.com. And by subscribing to the I Am Here, that's H-E-A-R, podcast feed. And of note, my episode of uh, Side Heroes aired last week. And people are saying really nice things about it. And it chokes me up. So go listen. Let me know what you think. Because I love it. I'm proud of you. Audio drums are a lot of work. It was so much work, but it was so much worth it. Another little note is this last Friday... I started up the C3 Friday Forge, where we are going to be, every week, putting out a prompt to create characters with us on Twitter. And then Tuesday, look out for the C3 Tuesday team-up. We are going to be taking some of those characters, mashing them together, and creating backstories for teams. So you guys will be collaborating together on Twitter, and I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. Also, if you want to take some of that over to our Discord, because 280 characters is not very many. Um, (laughs) Characters as in letters, not characters as in RPG characters, because 280 is like not even close to enough RPG characters. in the bucket. Right. Uh, You can head on over to our Discord, which is at discord.charactercreationcast.com, and you can talk to us about them over there as well, with many, many characters. We are... In sad news, almost out of reviews, and Very. it is really tragic. Mm-hmm. We really like the part of the show where we get to repeat nice things that other people said about us, and we like when we recognize the people that sent them, and then we can say nice things about those people. So please consider interacting with us on Twitter, Facebook, Discord. Please leave us a review so we can tell you how lovely you are while reading how lovely you think that we are. Mm-hmm. For example, this review is titled Focusing in on What Really Matters by The Dark Fiddler from the USA. The first episodes take a while for Amelia and Ryan to find their footing, but once they get going, it's a great time. By focusing in on what they really enjoy in tabletop gaming, you get to feel their passion and enjoyment in every episode. Add to that the fact that you can learn a lot about the game from its character creation, And this also serves as a good primer for learning about new systems and the other movers and shakers in the industry. P.S. Thanks for the intro to Protean City Comics in the Masks episodes. All in all, great fun, and I can't wait to see what this relatively new show grows into. Thank you so much, Dark Fiddle. With all of that out of the way, enjoy the show. back to our discussion episode. Last time we created a group of characters for Deadlands Reloaded. This episode we'll be discussing the character creation process. We are very excited to welcome back Cameron, Alex, and Caleb of the Sounds Like Crows podcast. We are going to start with Cameron this time. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself for everyone and tell us a little bit about the character you made? Yeah, absolutely. I'm Cameron Reed. I play Harper on Sounds Like Crows. Uh, Last time I made a man named Carson Nash. He's kind of a smooth talker from Louisiana, kind of a card shark face type character. All right. 
And Caleb, uh, do you want to introduce yourself again and tell us about your character? Yeah, I'm Caleb Sunstead. I'm the host and game marshal for Sounds Like Crows. Last time I made Jebin Keys, who was a chaplain in the Southern Army before he deserted and is running away from his past. And Alex, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your character? Yeah, sure thing. I'm Alex Horrell. I play Ellis on Sounds Like Crows. And last time I made a character by the name of Samuel Bronson. He's a little bit of a loner, lives in the woods, is kind of like a hermit. But he is a skilled bruiser with a oversized lumberjack's axe as his weapon of choice. I like the word bruiser. <laughs> Thank you, Caleb. Yeah, it's oh. a good descriptor. It's very nice. What about you, Emilio? Let's turn the flip the script here. <laughs> I made Lila Cooper, who is essentially the town witch, and she is a little bit crazy and has terrible dreams that are sometimes premonitions. Ryan, what'd you make? All right. I made a man by the name of Dirge Stranglethorn. Dirge is an outlaw gunslinger. He is one of the best out there with a pistol, and he likes a murdering as much as he can, and he likes stealing money from the people he murders. Hey, who doesn't? And now he's uh, now he's mixed up with these folks for some more shenanigans. You know what they say, murder early, murder often. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my grandma used to always say. <laughs> murder early, murder often. It's the only way to feed your hunger and quench your thirst. Which are the name of your guns. That's true. All right, so with all of that out of the way, we will go ahead and dive right into a segment we call D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts? So in this segment, we are going to talk with you guys about your thoughts on the character creation process, how it feels in the system compared to other systems. But first, we want to get to know each of you. So we are going to talk about how you guys got into role-playing games. How did you end up on a podcast? All of that. <laughs> Oh geez. Well, I guess I guess I'll start. There's there's a lot of stories. The one I haven't told yet is when I was a kid, when I was like 8 years old, we were super into Star Wars and we made a LARP. We didn't realize it was a LARP called the Jedi game and we came up with our own system of classes and like how you deflect blaster bolts and stuff. And uh honestly, that was just so much fun. I think 5 or I'm not even that long, like 4 years later, my older brother, Isaac, on, who's on Sounds Like Crows, was like, hey, you remember the Jedi game? There's like a board game that works similar to, to that. Why don't you come play this with me? And then we played um, a D20 modern system called Spycraft for one session, and it was terrible. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of those D20 systems are... I played D20 Modern was my first game. Okay. So I, we're lucky I'm still here. Yeah, yeah for real. <laughs> Alex, what's your origin story? I think I've always been interested with the genre of like RPGs, even as a kid. You know, I would play like Morrowind, Pokemon. Me and my cousins would do our own kind of form of LARPing too. Now that I think about it, now that you mentioned that, Dang. and uh, but my first experience with like tabletop RPGs was Pathfinder, and that was through Caleb actually. Caleb, uh, we used to work together, and he just kind of invited me to a session run by his brother, and after that, I kind of just fell in love with it. I really liked the character creation and the storytelling i just think it's a really cool creative outlet different brother mind you different brother oh yeah caleb has like 12 brothers <laughs> <laughs> as i say as soon as you said that like you had this made-up game with your siblings i was like you're from a big family too like... <laughs> all right well, what about you cameron so caleb actually brought me into it also well, it, more like Cameron Day from the show, but Caleb hosted the first game that I ever played in. It was actually in Savage Worlds. I mean, I was I was graduated from high school. I moved up to Fort Collins. I was probably 18 or 19. I also worked with Caleb uh, at a grocery store. You know, I was just making new friends up here, and uh, I came across Cameron Day, who invited me to play a session with Caleb. And I was a, I was a big jock. I mean, I still am to a certain extent, but you know, I had a I had a certain view of people who played D and D, growing up in high school, and you know the things that you heard. But um, I always loved like I played Skyrim a lot. I played lots of RPGs, like you know, like like Alex said, I played Pokemon a lot, and and some similar games to that. So I was pretty open to the idea of trying it out. And after that, I just fell in love. Um, I love building characters. I really love like the in depth like backstory building and storytelling aspects of it. And 
ever since that first time, I've just kind of been hooked. Can we uh, go and tell us uh, a bit about your personal processes for picking and creating characters in any role-playing game? I don't really know if you can call mine a process. <laughs> uh, normally, I, I hook onto one piece of inspiration. Sometimes it will be like a combat style. Sometimes it will be like a, an appearance aspect. Sometimes, in this case, it was a personality point. I really wanted to make somebody who was kind of a smooth talker. I imagined him in fine clothing and, uh, you know, good with cards. And from there, I build outwards. So sometimes it's a combat style, like I said, in, uh, in like D&D 5th. I really like the idea of somebody who uses a spear. So I would pick that and then I would build around that, optimize that, and then try to build the character and the personality around those aspects. And so it's it's kind of permeates from one specific thing and then I spread outward. Yeah, I would say that counts as a process. I, I guess you can say it does. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Alex? Mine kind of varies, honestly, depending on like the campaign that we were running or they'll be part of, it kind of depends on what kind of character I'll make. But one thing I think I kind of stick with with all my characters is I really like really weird backstories or like character traits. So I'll go with, I, I, lots of times I'll even try and keep them come with like a secret. And so I'll come up with that first and then I'll build. I'm a little bit of an optimizer. I think everybody in my playroom kind of <laughs> sees me as that. I'll, I'll admit that. Yeah. So then, but first I'll start with like a weird backstory and then I'll try and figure out the way that I can make that happen the best or the way like sticking to that flavor, what I can do to make it the best. But yeah, I always try and do something a little weird. Like that's why, I, that's one of the reasons I made Ellis in uh, Sounds Like Crows. Is we were kind of talking about character concepts and everybody was kind of talking about kind of stereotypical Western kind of tropes with the gunslingers and uh, judge with, a, you know, they're all kind of gunslingers. And then, um, I was like, no, I want to do a kung fu guy with a, with a weird backstory. <laughs> so that's kind of like what I like to stick to, I think. But yeah, I definitely optimize as well. What about you, Caleb? When you're not when you're not running the game? When I'm not running the game, again, I think my process differs a lot. Normally, I'll find one point of inspiration. Normally, it's a character voice I've been working on for a while. Something I say quite often is just try to do an impression of a character in a TV show or a movie and you'll fail and no one will know what you were trying to copy and then you'll just end up with something cool and new. So 50% that, 50% I try to find a bad choice optimizing wise within the system and then try to make that work. Yeah. Like this time I tried to do shooting in faith and then you t Ryan and Cameron picked gunslingers, so I dropped that idea. Uh, but, but I think, like, in Alex's last game, I played... Uh, so I'm sorry for people that don't play D&D 5th Edition, but I played a warlock who used Shalala, if that means anything to any D&D 5th players. Mm -hmm. So try to think about how that works. So, yeah, I try to pick a bad choice and then try to make it as optimal as possible. Very cool. That's very fun. I like the idea of, like, trying to, like, fix it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's cool because you end up doing stuff that nobody thinks is a good idea. And most of the time you end up with something that's average, you know, and which is. But like I more like it. interesting. Yeah, more interesting. And I don't feel bad about trying to optimize the heck out of the character, you know, because yeah. it starts at a bad point. I don't know if anybody has asked you guys this, but I'm interested to know what your processes are. Ooh, did we talk about this in our episode zero? I feel yeah, like I think, we did. I think we did. Yeah. I feel oh, like rip a for, Rooney. Yeah. No, for me, I I like to usually kind of start out with a personality idea of like who I want this who I want to play at the table, which doesn't work as well for this show because I never actually get to play these people. But <laughs> I usually like to to start with the idea of who I want to embody and then kind of pick stats and traits and stuff to build out from there. And then yeah, usually to kind of, of match with what everybody else is doing too i'm one of those people that like waits to see what everybody else is doing to kind of figure mm -hmm. stuff out yeah i agree with that i like trying to fit my character in with other people as much as possible yeah and, and for me i usually go with like a theme of the character or a certain feel i guess you could say for the character which is always good guy healer <laughs> well, <laughs> this time it's murder blood or guns good guy fighter good guy healer i, I think i've played a good guy like stealthy person once it's harder to play a good guy than it is to play a bad guy it's true to do it well uh, to do it well yeah yeah 
I yeah, that's my opinion. I guess maybe you guys don't share. That I agree. Kind of... It also kind of depends on who you're playing with, though. What kind of campaign it is. I yeah. also I think just depends on who you are too. Like Ryan might just be like a better person than the rest <laughs> of us. <laughs> <laughs> so like for me, I'm like yeah, playing a good guy probably is really hard, but I can't just like I can't not be snarky for mm. even ten minutes. So it's really <laughs> difficult. I would be fight playing this character. I would be fighting against my instinct to do good things oh i as feel this you character i feel really guilty like like if there i had one character who like was wronged and so what he like caught this guy and cut off his hands just like in retaliation and i felt so guilty <laughs> Did you, like go home I just, and like, cry into your pillow what have i done yeah i just straight up like amputated this dude's hands like in the snow and i was just like oh my god <laughs> what have i done <laughs> that is a pretty sweet visual though yeah. It was rough. <laughs> yeah, see, and I would a... be like, no, that's totally in character. Totally reasonable. It doesn't bother me. It's just a Friday night for Alec. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a big hand collection. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you think character creation in this game stacks up against other games that you've played? I know you guys have talked about playing D&D before. I'm not sure what else you guys have played, but how do you think that this compares to the other stuff you've tried? I just played Dread for the first time. Character creation that is amazing, although they do have the advantage of not having any stats or skills. <laughs> um, <laughs> I haven't done that one yet. How do you? I, what do you do for that? You just are handed a questionnaire of like nine to thirteen questions, and they're really pointed questions. So the first one might be something like, "Oh, you have a phobia. What is it? Hey, you have a minor tick that annoys people around you. What is it?" And then the third one would be like, how did your sister die? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yikes. Yes. And then it just takes you through it. it or <laughs> like we just played one where the four, the fifth question was, you lost your leg. How did it happen? And how has that affected you? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. Who do you hate in the group? That sort of thing. But well, against D&D 5th edition, which I think is a pretty common system, what do you guys think? I mean, I th honestly, I think it's clunky. It's not the best at building characters because a lot of the stuff is like intricately involved with each other. I think it it really devotes itself to creativity. And I think that's a really cool aspect of it is you have like a lot of options. And like I said, there's no classes. So you're not necessarily railroaded into any archetype. But that can also be difficult when you have a specific idea that you want to make and you don't really have the edges necessary to do what you had in mind and it's just kind of it's difficult to keep everything in line as you do it there's a lot of like going back and erasing and I mean I don't know how much of it is going to be edited out but I mean we had to go back and redo some of our stuff <laughs> even here and I put a lot of effort into like making sure that my stuff was pretty ironed out and I even had to backtrack a few yeah, times. yeah it seems like a lot of the pieces are really intertwined several of the other games that we've gone through kind of have this very clear flow from beginning to end you do this and then you do this and you do this and it kind of like sort of funnels you down into something whereas this is like this also relates to this and i'm making hand motions like anybody can even see me <laughs> but it's it all is kind of like tangled up yeah mm -hmm. how do you feel i think uh savage world is kind of i think it might be kind of difficult for like newer players mm -hmm. i feel like it's kind of a system where They've taken, I read using 5th edition a lot as a reference, but I mean, lots of people play it, so I guess it makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Where they've taken like that idea, and then they've, they've stripped away all of like the class archetypes and the classes themselves, and they've left that in the, the hands of the player, which is really cool with, as in, like an experienced player, because you kind of got to, you get to kind of build your own custom class with whatever abilities you want and whatever flavors you want. But as a new player, I think that would be kind of difficult. I also really like it that it kind of forces you to think about the flaws of your character. You don't see that super often, I feel like, with lots of systems. It's like, okay, there's a, everybody wants to build like a hero. They want to have all this cool stuff, but they never really think about like, oh, maybe my character has a phobia or maybe he's addicted to alcohol or you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. I think even the systems that do that, it's not always, I don't know if, I don't want to say that they're like not big enough, but like they're not highlighted very much. So you can kind of just hand wave them. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Every single hindrance in Savage Worlds has a mechanical disadvantage, yeah. which is something I think that a lot of systems that do this uh, f fail at. 
Yeah. I mean, you can hand wave it if you really try. Like I've, I've had a few characters where I've gone through and I've picked like, oh, he has a phobia of something that is, un, you know, I'm never going to come across this. You know, I, have a, I have a phobia of alligators, but I live in Colorado mm-hmm. or like I'm loyal to my family, but well, okay, well, my family's not around. I'm with like a bunch of random guys. So like, you know, these things are not going to apply. So you can manipulate it that way if you really want to. But then again, that's just that's a boring way to build a character, I feel like. Mm-hmm. There's nothing like nobody really wants their character to be an alcoholic, but how interesting is that yeah. in game? Yeah, I agree with that for sure. Being put in your character's shoes where you're forced to play with the hand of cards you're dealt um, really immerses you in that character, I think. Yep. It was, it was really interesting when I was going through it and noticed that the hindrances were more character development and the edges were more like class based right. abilities yeah. of sorts, mm-hmm. which I, I thought was a really interesting choice. And if I hadn't known what type of character that I wanted to make, I, I think it would have been a lot more difficult to go through all the different edges and all the different hindrances and pick things that would fit well together. Yeah. I think right. it's kind of cool that when when you make a character using like Savage Worlds and then you go play a different system, you still kind of have in the back of your mind some of the stuff that you do during the character creation of Savage Worlds and you might try and implement that. Like now if I make a 5th edition character, for example, I'll be thinking about like hindrances now. You know what I mean? Where before I wouldn't have done that before playing Savage Worlds. And that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. I do think the hard part about this one is that because there aren't any classes, usually in games that have classes, you get some skills or some techniques or whatever right off the bat from your class, and you can kind of see right away what things are important and which ones aren't necessarily, depending on what kind of character you want to play. It's like a little prepackaged thing. And so yeah. this one has a lot more creativity, and I said before, a little more flexibility with those things, but I think it's harder to find that starting point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it can be difficult to get exactly what you want as well, because like, I mean, if you wanted to be uh, like a gunslinger, like there are only so many options because mm-hmm. like Ryan's character is built very similar to how Harper on the show is built, and Harper is basically a lawful good character who like he uses one gun and blah 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 blah. But like, there's only so many ways to build like what you want. Like, if you want to build a melee guy who uses any type of weapon, there's like two or three edges that you can pick for that. So like we, we played a fantasy setting once and like, if you're playing a melee combatant at all, everybody has like one or two of the same edges. So it kind of limits you in terms of like your options, but that can also inspire you to be more creative with it. But I, as somebody who's fallen in love with D&D 5th, like I love being able to like have a like different flavor for something that's very similar. I will say that I've never been reading through the edges in like a Savage Worlds book and like said to myself, "Oh wow, that's really cool." But like <laughs> if I'm reading through like the class features in uh, D&D or something and I'll come to something I'm like, "Oh, that's awesome. I want to play this class." You know what I mean? Like the edges there there's lots of diversity, but there's there's maybe too general. I feel like maybe. So if we were to like make a different system that had maybe some more specific edges that you could pick it might be a lot cooler. A lot of the mm-hmm. burden to make characters that fulfill the same archetype different from each other falls on the player's role playing, not so much on the mechanic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Which again isn't necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, it just depends on what you want from a game. But I could see how in a lot of cases you could put two of the same character sheets in front of a person, you know, in front of two different people and get completely different characters, which sometimes is really cool. I know when we did our our masks episode, um, my character had almost all of the same boxes checked as James's did. And we still Mm -hmm. had two totally different characters. So you can Mm -hmm. flavor it interestingly, but I don't think that the game does that for you. Yes. Right. Right. So how do the mechanics of character creation then reinforce the feel that uh, the developers were kind of going for in Deadlands? I mean, you're not heroes, for sure. The hindrances immediately pop that in. I think the worst nightmare helps getting you into the 
horror side of things and just with how expensive everything is what's your your highest skill is a d10 in shooting right ryan uh it's a d12 in shooting oh d12 <laughs> right yeah yeah but like that's that's a big sacrifice to do yeah. that right like mm-hmm. you spend a third of your your points doing that mm-hmm. so i think it's cool that novice characters at least if you're good at something you're not good at anything else and most characters are not going to be great at a lot of things mm-hmm. you're going to fail a lot yeah you going in you go in feeling like you are incapable. <laughs> you're saying like, capable. Like, I mean, I, I, mean, I feel, feel vulnerable, like, I think. Yeah, vulnerable. vulnerable is a better way to put it. You always feel, and even at higher levels, you feel vulnerable. That's like that's something that comes with Savage Worlds and Deadlands, is that at any moment you can die. But then again, at any moment you can succeed with flying colors. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had this one character that in one turn, one shot a boss did over i think it was 50 damage just because i was lucky i was blowing up a bunch of dice it was a crazy move and then uh that boss had a um an action that went off after he died which caused a bunch of damage and he also blew up a whole bunch of damage and so basically over the course of one turn i one shot the boss and then was immediately one shot wow so this game is very swingy and i feel like the the character creation owes itself to feeling vulnerable and knowing that like at any moment you can be gone. Just looking at the stats of a weapon versus toughness, a standard revolver does 2d6 damage, which on average will do 7 damage. And I, as a quote, tough character, have a toughness of 6. So that means on average I'm going to be shaken every time I'm hit. And there's like a 30% chance I'm going to take a wound every time I'm shot. Mm which is a third of my health. I do want to I do want to say I think that some of that feeling comes through in the way that you spend points, like the number of points that they give you, like how things are rated because there are other games where it's like okay, this costs 2 points and the next level is 6 points and then the next, you know, whatever. Whereas this one, you start out and it's like you have 5 points and you're like that's that's not very many points. <laughs> right. And like clearly I can right. distribute them because each thing only costs 1 past the previous one, but it still you have this feeling of like i have 15 points for skills i have five points for attributes like it feels like i have nothing right Mm -hmm. the skills are spread out very thin and because of that i think it's like well i'm not good at anything except for maybe one thing that you pick you know yeah deadlands i have nothing i have nothing (laughs) and then they throw stuff like guts in there and it's like oh you want to take this edge you gotta have knowledge and it just gets thinner and thinner and thinner until yeah you feel like you're going to get killed by a horse. A <laughs> drunk horse. And sometimes you do. Sometimes you do. And sometimes you do. Spoilers, guys. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so I, we've covered this a little bit, but do you feel like the process of character creation kind of helps set your expectations for playing this game? Yes. Yeah, it it definitely does. You feel like, I mean, when you once you actually get into playing, do you feel like you totally are incapable of things? Like Well, one thing we haven't talked about yet is the wild die. So anytime you're making a roll, you roll an additional d6, and then if it's better than your normal roll, you get that instead. So it's actually pretty easy to succeed at stuff. Like most of the time you have a 60% chance of succeeding at something if you have a d4 in it, I think. Someone's going to correct me on that math, but... We don't care about math on this show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> dealing with basic Dealing with basic problems, I mean... I think you feel you feel pretty capable once the game starts. You just feel vulnerable. I yeah, think that's exactly. a really good. You feel word. vulnerable. You feel like any like the enemy can do the exact same thing you can do. And then they're in the exact same boat. Like at any moment, you know, they can blow up a dike. Yeah. It really excels at gunfights in that exact situation because like even if somebody is better than you with a gun, like there's still a chance that you just shoot them in the heart and that's game over. Like that's mm-hmm. it. Like yeah. all you need is one. Or it could go the other way, where there's some right. joker who's never picked up a gun in his life and just happens to roll really well and then winds up killing you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I think that every single encounter, no matter what it is, there's kind of like that thought in the back of your head that something could go wrong, and that's that's why they have the binnies. You know, they've thought of that. They're like, yeah, we need some, we need the binnies in place. <laughs> and but I think that that's kind of where Savage Worlds excels too, in a way. It really captures that feeling that oh man, I'm in a real gunfight here. You know what I mean? I could get hit by a stray bullet any time here. Has that changed how you play? 
a little bit. I mean, because in D&D, it's like every time you walk up against something, you're like, yeah, obviously I'm going to get in a fight with it. Like, that's the whole point of this game. And yeah. I think I like think- this and there, you know, there are some other games that do that, too, where it's the system itself is kind of discouraging you from getting into those kinds of fights. I think we kind of play differently, honestly, than we normally would when we're doing a podcast. Because I think that I try, when if I'm just playing a regular game, I'm going to tend to be maybe a little bit more metagamey and not stick to my character as much. But and when I'm playing the podcast, I'm like, okay, I got to stick to this character. I got to do what my character do, would do. So if I'm not a cautious person, like even though I know, like me as a player knows that, man, this is a bad situation. I could get killed. I still go into it if that's what my character would do. Yeah, I found that too. You tend to make much more interesting story decisions rather than like good decisions when you're playing for a podcast. You're like, this would be Mm -hmm. better for other people to listen to, but I know it's the wrong choice. (laughs) Right. In terms of like the meta aspect of things, I feel like it's definitely changed the way that I play. At least, at least when it comes down to bennies, I'm way more likely to hold on to my bennies until I get shot and just like try to use that to soak. I used to be like really attack heavy and like, you know, I would whiff on like a really big, like heavy handed attack and oh, I'm going to Benny that and, you know, try to hit him again. And I found uh, recently, I guess it wasn't recently, when we first started playing, we had an entire party get killed, just like a huge party wipe. And since then, I've been a little more cautious about like when and where I use my bennies. So I think that just kind of comes with experience when it comes to playing with Savage Worlds. But, I mean, I don't feel like it's really changed my play style in terms of, like, how I play my characters or anything like that. I think that. you have to have a certain mindset when you're playing Savage Worlds. You have to be okay with your character just being killed at any moment and just trying to have fun with it, I think. Like yeah. If- yeah. Or going insane. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, they go insane, too. That's a thing. That is a possibility. So, what would you think is the biggest flaw of character creation in this system? This rule book. Yeah, <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Like, yeah, I'd second that. Honestly, I think most of our complaints could just be solved with if someone rewrote like a 10-page description of here's how you should build a character instead of how they tell you to build one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just like if they would reorganize everything, that would make it a thousand times more easy. Yeah, I don't mean to insult the layout person at Pinnacle, but maybe get a new layout <laughs> person. <laughs> it, can, it gets rough at times. It gets a little rough. Yeah. Like for, I don't know if you're going to keep it in there, but when we were looking for the Huckster stuff, that got a little out of hand. You need two books, you know, they have Huckster information in the Deadlands Guide, but the the one the information we're looking for is in a different book that's not talking about Hucksters. Yeah. It's talking about something else. If that got cut, we spent like seven minutes, four of us looking through yeah. Rulebook, and we finally found it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And we just needed to know like how many spells. It was just right, right. Like a really basic, like step one of being a caster. How many powers do I have? Well, you're gonna want to go to check the the Huckster page in the in the Deadlands guide, and it's gonna tell you to go check the Deluxe right. guide on page four. You know, it doesn't even tell you the page. Just go check the the magic part of the Deluxe guide, and then you spend like 45 minutes looking through that, and then you find out that it's like in this tiny little box at the bottom. Like, oh, I mean, blah 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 blah. Here's the Huckster thing. Yeah, stuff like that's always in the middle of a paragraph. It's like, can you just put a box at the top that says you yeah, get right? three yeah. spells? Yeah, I have a little yeah. table with yeah. all the different spellcasters and just have it right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, that was a little rough. I'm not. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to lie to you. And I, I think too, I would agree that there's. I feel like saying a limited number of choices doesn't feel right, but it is kind of limited, especially when you get to the edges. It like feels there's limited. only depending on what you want to do. It's like these two apply to this kind of character. Right. C- yeah. Caleb said something on an interview with uh, Shadow of the Cabal that I feel like really encaptured this entire thing, which is if you want to be a gunslinger, pick the gun edge. There you go. That's that's there you go. It's done. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what did yeah. we just spend two hours talking about that? <laughs> Why didn't you say that up front? Also, I like that we're continuing our tradition of mentioning Shadow of the Cabal on every single episode so that I can get my money from Tanner. Yeah. Left out of the basement. <laughs> <laughs> He's never going to let you out of there. You know it. <laughs> How balanced would you say the different character types are? Do you think there are certain types that are significantly better? I mean, there's not really classes in this game, but... If we limit it to the core guides, I'd say that Alex has brought to light some 
kind of ridiculous notions that you could accomplish. Playing yeah. rules is written. So I would say that as it's written, spellcasters with access to haste are... Uh, it's like called Quicken or something. Oh, it's called like Quicken. Basically, I'm sorry. there's a spell you can cast that gives you like two turns per round, like two separate turns. You can just <laughs> you can get it pretty early on. Lots of GMs just don't play with that. I don't know. As far as like damaging spells and stuff, it's not too crazy compared to just like a gunslinger. Yeah, I would agree with that. So as long as you kind of work with your players about the powers they pick, which you should be doing in your games anyway, I think. It's kind of hard to make it unbalanced because how good you are in combat is just how good your skill is at shooting or fighting. You I know? will say this, though. It was extremely difficult to build, like, Ellis as a character because there's, like, three edges involved. I have to have a lot of different... Just to be, like, a kung fu kind of character, mm-hmm. you have to have a lot of different stuff going on. But, say, uh, Harper, for example, who's just a typical gunslinger, all he needs is a gun, and he can just, you know, he can do almost the same amount of damage as me. Mm-hmm. And the martial artists aren't like out of left field. They're a core part of the game. Right. That yeah. is presented as a viable character option. Yeah. So it can be very unbalanced, kind of depending on what 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 your players are doing. Because your players can definitely like go through and find some things that are going to like break your game. But if everybody like I guess it's not really fair to say if everybody does what they're supposed to be doing. Because like <laughs> if you I work really, together on it. Right. So it's like you almost have to babysit your players to make sure that they don't have anything game-breaking. So I wouldn't necessarily... I don't think you can call it balanced. I don't think you can either. As a, as a GM, do you feel like it's... Like you're able to run a game with those various types of players? I know I keep going back to L5R because that's the game that I know the best. But I know that when we talked to Tanner too, he was like, yeah, you can do it for like two of the three types. He's like, you can have a courtier and a bushi. You can have, you know. So like, is it easy enough to run a game with like those different kinds of characters? Or is it hard to find something for everybody to do? From my personal experience, I would say it's pretty easy. I don't find that I have difficulty balancing encounters or making the players share the spotlight. But, I mean, to be honest, they do most of the work when it comes to that, you know? Even if someone isn't suited for the fight they're in, they're finding some some thing they could be doing, even if I didn't present it to them, that gives them a purpose within that scene or encounter. But, I, yeah, I haven't had any problems with it. Even in games we've run in the past, I don't think I've had any problems with it. You've run two games in Savage Worlds, right? Did you encounter any problems? Just one. I think I just ran that one, didn't I? I don't remember. No, I don't think so. Yeah, you just ran the one game. You just TPK'd us twice, <laughs> so it feels like... <laughs> yeah, so maybe balance was, maybe. was an issue? That... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are just unlucky. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of that was, yeah, just being unlucky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, honestly. It's a scary, scary system. But no, I, I don't think so. I mean, the system's so swingy. Even if you made an unbalanced encounter, I'm not sure the players would notice. I don't think there's such thing as balance in Savage Worlds. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Which isn't bad if you know that going into it. You know, like yeah. if you don't have that expectation, yeah. that's okay. I think if you go into it being like, everything is a fair fight, well, then it gets a little rough. Mm-hmm. And the game does broadcast that pretty well. It says early on that there are some fights that are just unwinnable. In Deadlands specifically, a quarter of the monsters either cannot be damaged, period, or can only be damaged with one specific weakness. And if the players aren't aware of that, then, I mean, Run. they can't do anything wow. anyway. Yeah. So running is definitely supposed to be a big option. I guess that makes a lot of sense in if you're introducing these sorts of pretty insane sort of monsters into an old west technology sort of world yeah that's one of the most interesting things to me is trying to figure out a way where you can introduce these things without them killing the players or giving them options to run so you definitely have to think about encounters where you need to telegraph how dangerous these things are and you need to give them multiple options to escape from it Mm -hmm. and be willing to accept that option how does creating an NPC then differ from creating a player character? I'm going to keep talking and say that making NPCs in this game is the greatest joy of any role-playing game I have ever played. I rarely make them. Maybe I'll pick hindrances and edges for them, but most of the time you can just say, hey, this guy's a famous gunslinger. He's got a D10 in shooting. He's probably pretty intimidating. Let's give him a D8. And you can kind of 
logic out the skills as they come up. And because the attributes don't add modifiers to anything the skills just stand alone it's really easy to just come up with characters on the fly and a lot of times i'll just ask the players like hey what do you what do you folks think these like this person would have in this skill and then we'll come up with it on the spot if you'd want to make them traditionally which i have with sort of the big npcs in the game you just build them like you do a character without really paying attention to points you just sort of pre-pick yeah they're pretty they're pretty dexterous so they got a d8 in agility they got a d10 in strength and then just go down the line picking what you want them to have that's really interesting yeah i feel like that's kind of nice though because because things don't have modifiers you don't have to do the math of what would it mean to be good at this like what is you know, what do I have to add yeah. to all of these things? It's just like, which die has more numbers on it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and players don't really notice when you're doing that either. There doesn't there doesn't seem to be a change in gameplay from pre-making them or making them up on the spot. Mm-hmm. So I really like that. Well, yeah, being it that it's based on logic, it's not it's not difficult as a player to look at an NPC and say like, oh, crap, this guy has a D8 in shooting? That doesn't belong there. Like, if it belongs there, it belongs there. You know, like, if we're fighting yeah. a, you know, a famous gunslinger, if he has a D10 in shooting, like, he has a D- D10 in shooting. Like, it doesn't it yeah. doesn't feel un- imbalanced at all because that just means that he's that good at that thing. And because it's, because they're built via logic, it doesn't, using my own logic to look at them, it doesn't make them feel imbalanced or anything. Mm-hmm. That's actually really nice. I like that. So I want to discuss the group that we made. <laughs> do you think we would do well in a game? Or are we garbage? <laughs> what's our highest what's our highest persuasion? Uh I have a D eight plus two. Oh. What's our highest investigation? I've got a D four. Looks sounds like a uh, D four. <laughs> <D4. Yeah. laughs> hey, yep. That'd be um, a D four. And then I kind of remember most of the other I think we do okay. I think we would. In a fight, we'd kill it for sure. Honestly, yeah. I think the hardest part would be figuring out why we're all sticking together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's kind of up to like the, the story of it, too, whatever the main story would be of the campaign. Yeah. We could find reasons, too, I'm sure. And presumably, mm-hmm. we would have known a little bit about that before we, before we did right. this. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, we've got, we've got you as a spellcaster, me as a spellcaster, and then we got a tank-ish. Yeah, as tanky as Savage Worlds can get. Yeah, mm-hmm. and we got our smooth talker, and we got our gunslinger. So I feel pretty good about it, honestly. Yeah, I feel like we could, we could definitely work our way through a campaign. We have enough of the pieces that you need. You know, we have a healer, we have a little bit of AOE. Yeah, I think we do well. There might be some inner party conflict, though. Yeah, who doesn't need it? Yeah. Cool, That's though. my favorite. It'd be so cool. So. <laughs> yeah. I, I I like some light PvP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and see it's funny that you mentioned that because one of the things that i like is working together with the groups with my characters i like my characters to be liked so <laughs> this was well out of the comfort zone for me yeah. i don't know it depends on the situation maybe you'd be an all-star and you know i like him i'd be curious to know what he's famous for because with those kind of skills i mean you've got to be killing people left and right you know right Oh, easily. but we're in a lawless wilderness. You know what I mean? So who knows? Maybe you're not that bad of a guy in our world. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> true. If those guns are on our side, you know, that's moral yeah. relativism. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. That's what the <laughs> West just was built on. Just don't cross me. Yep, just don't cross you. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll just convince you that I didn't. As long as you guys let me say grace at every meal, we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go ahead and talk about the system as a whole now. What do we all think uh, about how the system would play and how it lends to character development? I I mean, I'm just, I don't want to go first again, you guys. I think it does a really good job of that, honestly. I think that's one of its strongest points is character development and uh, just kind of extending the character building process where you're thinking about, you know, once again, your hindrances, what you're good at, what you're bad at. A lot of that plays into the the players as well, you know, what kind of character arc they want to do and how well they portray that. But as far as, like, how the system plays, I think it does what it's supposed to do. I mean, it's a system called Savage Worlds. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yes. And it it definitely is. It's definitely fast-paced, dangerous, but I think that's what it's supposed to be. So I think it does a good job there. Once again, my only complaint is the ambiguous rules, you know, the structuring of the rule system. 
yeah, I think it does a good job in the in building the characters, and I think the gameplay reflects what it's supposed to reflect. A thing you can do too as the game advances is not only you're getting edges, which help you flavor your character a little bit and make them better at certain things, but you can be changing your hindrances if they don't really make sense anymore. So if if for some reason I you know, we, we went way west, way away from where my desertion would be a problem. We could swap out the wanted and figure out to how to work some other hindrance into the narrative, which helps the characters advance. And also, your characters are kind of forced to change in some certain situations. For example, in our podcast, Sounds Like Crows, there's been lots of characters who maybe pick up phobias, or, you know, your character can get a permanent injury, they're, it kind of forces them to kind of change their way of thinking sometimes even. So that's kind of cool too. Yeah, I like that you can build those in with the story because I think that sometimes it's like you hit this arbitrary point and it's you level up and then you have all these things, but it doesn't make sense to the actual character arc. So it feels like you have the opportunity to make those things match up with what's actually going on at the table. Right. Yeah. I also feel like the natural progression as you learn to RP a character, you know, like session one, you don't really know who your character is until say, you know, three sessions in when you've kind of, you've learned what they're into. You kind of, you kind of find your footing. And I feel like that owes itself uh, pretty heavily to how you play up your hindrances. You know, you might not play up your hindrances too heavy until, you know, session three or four. And then you get like halfway through a campaign and you've kind of tacked down, you know, how I would play Arrogant, for example, or, uh, you know, Tenderfoot. You don't really know how that's going to play out until you start playing. So I think that has a lot of opportunity for development. It's like being in a relationship where everything's fine at first and nothing's wrong. And then, you know, like three or four (laughs) months in, you're like, oh, here's all the problems. (laughs) I found it. (laughs) four years in you know you start a podcast that takes 20 hours a week (laughs) finally i want to move on to actual character advancement so we are going to go ahead and talk about leveling up and that kind of stuff and go into our segment that we call take it up a level take it up a level take it up a level In this segment, uh, we will cover how character advancement, or leveling up, is covered in the system. So, how does a character level up in Deadlands Reloaded, and what sort of perks are we looking at when that happens? So, you're probably going to be leveling up every two sessions or so, if you're, depending on the kinds of activities you're getting up to. There's no level. There are no levels, you're right. Mm -hmm. And by leveling, I mean uh, you're getting an advancement. You're getting one advancement. You can spend an advancement on either two skills that are below your linked attribute to increase them by one die type, or you can spend an advancement to increase a skill above its linked attribute. Or to buy a skill. Or to buy a skill, or to pick a new edge. Pick a new edge. Okay. And then once every rank, you're allowed to increase one of your attributes by one. And there's four advancements for every rank. So we'll be a novice for four advancements, and then on that fourth one, we'll become seasoned. So it's basically a point system. Your GM will award you points based off of what you do in session, um, and every five points is when you get an advancement. So oh. at 20 points, for example, you'll rank up. So you'll still from novice to season once you're at 20 points. And then every 20 points goes from, you know, veteran, heroic, legendary, I think is all of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. And each one of those unlocks new edges that we couldn't pick at character creation. They get more and more crazy as the ranks go up. Yeah. I will say that as they get crazier and crazier, so do the prerequisites. So (laughs) it takes a lot of planning. That's one thing I'll say about leveling in Savage Worlds is you have to keep your build in mind. And you have to be constantly checking and double checking what your goals are. Because, you know, you could get, you know, three advancements down the line. And then realize that, oh, well, I needed to pick up two more skills in shooting in order to get this edge that I was after. And now I can't do that. So you have to be, every time that you advance your character, you need to be paying attention to what your goals are. That being said, you can get some really cool stuff later on. Does that bother you about this system? I mean, some people really like that. But I feel like sometimes when you have to think about stuff so far ahead of time, it becomes a little bit difficult to to keep it in line with what's happening at the table. 
if that makes sense. It is difficult at times. Personally, I like to think about my builds that far ahead, so it's not too much of an issue for me. But I there are definitely times where, where you were originally planning on going kind of contradicts what's happening in game. And that can be kind of frustrating at times. I think there are also enough options that you should be able to find something you want. And most of the time, the the edges that you want, the prerequisites make sense. Like, yeah, there might be an edge that's all about being a scary gunslinger that has intimidation and shooting in it. So a lot of the time, too, it kind of just helps you pick the edge I found because you see what you're actually allowed to pick and there's enough options i think without crazy prerequisites that it's not too big of a hassle yeah i don't think you need to plan it out from character creation i think you could probably start at the beginning of one rank to the next and you can meet most prereq yeah that's normally how i do it is rank to rank i'll just kind of look at the you know veteran edges and see like okay well i want to aim for this one so i need to make sure that i get like you know one more in my smarts and maybe you know two in noting and a lot of the edges are like continuations of earlier edges. Okay. So say you start level one and you you'll get trademark weapon and you like the flavor of it, like, oh, it's your trademark weapon. You get a little bonus with it. Then later on, there's improved trademark weapon. Then you can just kind of go down that path. And there's a lot of edges like that too. Yeah. So it kind of does a little bit of the planning for you. Yeah. So you don't have to like, you know, plan out a, a bunch. You kind of just, as you're creating your character, you kind of see that down there. You're like, oh, I should shoot for that later if I'm getting this. So you don't need like post-it chart, post-it notes and like a flow chart. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You just kind of see <laughs> okay. it down there. Thankfully It's kind of just a natural progression. Yeah. These aren't prestige classes. You're fine. <laughs> can, can you ever get rid of your hindrances? Not. Oh, man. I feel stupid because I feel like you might be able to buy them off. But most of the time when it's come up in game, it's been like, hey, this doesn't make any sense anymore. What do we do? And it's pretty easy just to figure out something else or yeah i don't know if there's necessarily a mechanical way to do that but i feel like as a character you probably should be aiming to at least edit those you know as your character develops and grows you know some of their hindrances aren't gonna you know exactly line up with who they are as a person anymore so you should try to find a better one and i feel like when it comes to hindrances particularly it kind of leads itself to homebrew. I feel like you could come up with some really good homebrew hindrances. Easily. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially because they're just classified in into major and minor. It's not like a point by system with those. So it's really easy to say like, this is a big thing. This is a small thing. Like that's to just change them out like that is pretty. Exactly. Yeah. And a lot of them will actually like tell you in there. Like for example, enemy. It'll say like, if one day your enemy is defeated, the GM should gradually try and work in another enemy, for example, or uh, doubting Thomas. Yeah. Like, isn't there something in there that's like I the think... encounter that something crazy happens? It kind of makes you lose that hindrance and then. Oh, and then you buy something else. You get like a, yeah, you get like a phobia or something instead. I can't remember, but I yeah. can't remember either. But it's kind of in the, it's kind of a case by case basis on a lot of them. Yeah. I, would, I would feel like some of them too. Like if you, at least if I were running a game, I would say that like, if you, play out a way that you've gotten over that or gotten past that it would make sense like why would you why would you keep that right i agree yeah if if that was my game i'd work after they got it off after they got rid of the hindrance i would definitely work with them to be like hey we need to work in another hindrance somehow in the next few sessions yeah you should definitely like have something to swap it out with because you can't be perfect ryan (laughs) yeah this is savage worlds come on (laughs) (laughs) Well, I feel like that really kind of covered everything that we needed to cover for that portion because we already answered the next question. So we did. Perfect. I think we can move on to closing it up unless anybody else has anything to say. Any last words? Uh, Alex is Uh, six foot six. (laughs) (laughs) I think there is one thing that we didn't mention, which is, I don't know if we should. What do you got? There's a mechanic in Deadlands that's kind of like core to like the Deadlands uh, meta plot. And it's a mechanic where um, there's something called harrowed. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure. This is one of those areas where I'm not sure where the player information starts and ends. It's kind of a the secret. Does. It, in, yeah. the, in the player's guide, you get to a section and it says, don't go beyond this point unless the GM tells oh. you to. It's like a secret from the player. But it's kind of like core to a lot of like the mythology of Deadlands, isn't it? Yeah. 
I mean, but is it is it important to character creation? Sometimes, because there's like, um, for example, Veteran of the Old West. Yeah. If you get like a, I don't remember what it is. Dude, if you I, get a Joker, you start out as this. I mean, it's it's crazy. I mean, I'm fine going into it. I think if if I was a, I don't know. I think I would enjoy the surprise if I was a listener. Okay. Yeah, we probably shouldn't talk about it too much. Then. So <laughs> if you want to look it up because you're the kind of person that doesn't like surprises, you can go do that on your own time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> or just marshal a game, and that way you can read all the fun bits without feeling guilty at all. Right. It is a really cool mechanic, though. Yeah. Or you can hit up Alex on Twitter because obviously he wants to talk <laughs> about it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us to talk about Deadlands Reloaded character creation. Caleb, can you go ahead and remind everyone where they can find you? Yeah. Again, I host this cool Deadlands actual play podcast. Probably my favorite game I've ever run, uh, whether people enjoy it or not, called Sounds Like Crows. You can find it at soundslikecrows.com. Crows is spelled like Russell Crow. You can tweet at me at Sounds of Crows or tweet at me at Marshall Caleb, or send me an email at soundslikecrows at gmail.com. Thank you so much. And Cameron, what about you? You can contact me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is cjreed211, and most likely I will be the one to respond to you from the Sounds of Crows handle. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> um, also, I play Harper on uh, Sounds Like Crows. You lift weights. I lift weights. Uh, try to be a big, strong, natural boy. You are not six foot six. I no, am not. I'm, not. I'm six foot. Well, speaking of six foot six, uh, how about you, Alex? <laughs> yeah, my name's Alex. I'm uh, six foot six. You can find me at um, Twitter dot com. Just go to uh, just go to Twitter dot com. You go there and uh, you can look, look, for, look for um, Orson underscore Sharp. O R S O N underscore. S H A R P E. And I probably won't respond, but maybe I will. Or he's at six foot six yep. at gmail.com. Don't say or, that. Or just go outside and look up. <laughs> supposed to dox me yeah, like that. You might see him. Yep. He's like maybe. tall enough. You could see him from here. <laughs> well, thank you so much, guys, for joining us. Seriously, everyone who's listening to this, you should listen to Sounds Like Crows. It is so good. I had not had any interaction with Savage Worlds prior to listening to your show. I started listening to it because Tanner and Ryan were super excited about it and wouldn't shut up about it. And I don't like when people know things that I don't know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I had to listen to it and it is so good. Like it, I very recently like caught up like right at the end of season one, right as the first episode of season two is coming out. And now I have to wait week to week and it's very traumatic for me. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for yeah, having thanks. us on. That means a lot. Yeah, we appreciate yep. it. That was awesome, thanks. Guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you to everybody else for joining us. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license, or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game system used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also check our notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, like dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. We'll make Wave that work. Forms. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yours was way before mine, Cameron. I got a little antsy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so excited. <laughs> it's also like weird seeing faces. Yeah, it is. When huh? I'm talking to people. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, like all your voices are familiar, but your faces are not like.
Yeah, I, I've like seen you're actual real faces. people, not ghosts. <laughs> right. that's, cool. that's cool. One of us is a ghost. <laughs> we don't know which one. <laughs> you gotta figure it out. Hold on, I'm gonna retake that. We've got rare animal noises. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, it's a cute dog, though. Wait, no kidding. He's all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's so rude. You should see the other one. The other one's it's the cutest good. dog. The new one. This one over here on the couch. No, the, the one. new one's okay. There's three dogs. The new one's total. okay. <laughs> it's like the new one's pretty cute. I saw a picture. All right, sorry, future. Nice. Whoever does that. They're not so bad. I'm I mean, used to it. It's true. I'd like to. That's he like high praise. Go. You'll get used. To it. It's like, like I, it's I an tried. acquired taste. I had him going for like two weeks. <laughs> two days. It was two days. <laughs> a plus. <laughs> it was one day. I do. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Spoilers. Hey, <no> spoilers. <laughs> You know what, Ryan though? I had, this. like, so much of Redemption ruined for me when we recorded, too, though. So oh, <laughs> I was, like, not oh, far geez. enough into that. I'm only, like, five episodes in. I'm well, half an episode. Okay, it's not like you didn't know this was coming. Okay. You had time. Shush. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you shush me. <laughs> yeah, the stuff uh, exists kind of else. All that stuff exists everywhere in the world, but I think that... Oh my gosh. Take care of this cat. Yeah, take care of that cat. Sorry, guys. Jeez. <laughs> it's fine. We should have just put all the pets in a boarding house or something. <laughs> <laughs> we <just> sold them <laughs> no, Amelia's got the right idea. We need a closet. I think. Uh, I'm actually not closet. in the closet anymore. Oh, they... whoa, you're not. Whoa. No, well, they had to like clear it all out to fix my air conditioner, and I have not put everything back in there. So that's now fair. it's real echoey. So yeah, I know. That's always work. an issue. <clears throat> Anyway, sorry, what was the last thing we were, we were saying? I wasn't saying anything. We were talking about places. We were talking about places, right? <clears throat> do, you, do you guys mind if we stop for two minutes so these dogs yeah, stop freaking out? No, that's fine. Hey, what's up? She do good? I'm sure we are the worst. Yeah, this is bad. <laughs> <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> this is about how our recording sessions go, too. Take I care, will turn take, off this microphone. Take care of those mouth noises. Um, nom, nom. When you don't have mouth noises, make your own. <laughs> we have like, I'm sure we have like a 45 minute clip reel that Caleb has just taken of At everybody eating minutes. stuff. Plus Cameron just likes to go. Yeah, Cameron spends a lot of time making mouth noises on mic for he some reason. I don't know what it Every is. time there's a silence. I'm going to pull a Dakota and say that I spend at least 30 minutes every episode editing out mouth noises. 30 minutes every episode. Coming back in with the minutes. mouth noises. Yeah. They really need like a filter for mouth noises. <sighs> it would be nice. <laughs> oh, There's got to be, yeah. All Somebody those little, to... right before people start talking. Although I've noticed if you go look, listen to professional stuff, you can definitely pick it out. I think yeah. we just notice because we're editing it, but I think it's kind of like, you okay. need to rem remove lips from people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we wouldn't have the problem. <laughs> okay. Isn't it funny how much more you pick up though once you've edited yeah. when you yeah. listen to other podcasts yep, you're like this sure. is horrible <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. like oh. even, even in your podcast. own speech too the number of times i say um or oh, like my God. or yeah. any of those things yeah what's yeah yeah i won't get into that <laughs> <laughs> oh do no I'm just <laughs> <laughs> welcome to character editing cast yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're getting some interference over here folks ghost phone Right, and now it's gone. I hit the table and it <laughs> I fixed, told you. I hit the table and it fixed it. <laughs> it works ninety percent of the time. Powers. You know what we should have done as a joke? What ahead of time just decided we we're all going to be really mean to each other the whole time. <laughs> that that really mean. Good. As a joke. Though. As a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but we wouldn't tell you guys about it. So you yeah. guys would be like, man, those sounds like crow's boys. They hate each other. That was wow. rough. Such good acting on their show. They seem like friends. <laughs> Cameron shows up 20 minutes late and just sits down, doesn't make eye contact, drops dice. Let's make some I'm people. Excited. You got it. <laughs> I did the little good. voice that they do it's on the show. Wow. Wow. Okay, well, well, you did it. You haven't listened. <laughs> you I've welcome... listened to at least two series. You guys are welcome to use that in place of your regular one if you want. Yeah, for now. All of your if, you, yeah. if you like it. That's yours I'll just keep. overlay it over the other one. <laughs> good. Oh, yeah. If they like Perfect. it. Perfect. They do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> <laughs> He's been working on that for like a week, by the way. Yeah. I've been practicing, practicing in the mirror. Yeah. I hear him in the bathroom. <laughs> People flavors. <laughs> <laughs> Please, ed editor James, you can cut that. 
my pencil's not working, so I'm even further behind. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I gotta get my. I can't get my book to open for some reason. So you guys edit down this part really well, but how long does it normally normally take? Am I gonna be really slow here? It's not too bad, really. I mean, we leave a lot of this sort of talk in because we want to have the the audience hear kind of what we're doing. Mm. Uh, we want you to have the authentic experience yeah. of hanging out with us. Exactly. Oh, man. Why'd you give me your pencil? I want the working one. I was hoping we could <laughs> yeah, yeah. swap. There you go. Tested all of these pencils and none of them work. I don't understand, guys. <laughs> that magic phone. When do we when do we reveal our names? Let's check our show notes, Alex. <laughs> um, I think uh, names we'll do in the background portion, right? We can do them whenever. I'm Johnny Two Shoes. It's a stupid name. It's a good name, Caleb. <laughs> I like <your> shoes. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I deal with. I, I got my name though. I've got mine too. Is yeah. it Legs Macintosh? <laughs> <laughs> I was no. thinking Damn about it. doing oh, that actually. You can't build so Legs yeah. Macintosh. It'd be too close. He's to too Alice. good. That's such a good idea. Why didn't I do that? You couldn't do it. No one, no I'm one. So can disappointed do it. in all of you. Nobody can truly build problem. legs. Macintosh. No one can build legs. Macintosh. <laughs> he's legendary, except for legs. Macintosh, but he's not here. Oh he's my. In my. I forgot what was what is his, his psychic's name. Blitz Mitzen. Blitz Mitzen. <laughs> legs Macintosh and Blitz Mitzen. Blitz Mitzen's the opposite of legs. He's got real short legs, really long arms. Yeah, but he's strong. like a gorilla. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> all right, give me, give me some. I don't even know where we are. We're we're still on attributes. Go watch Tombstone if you don't know who those characters are, <laughs> listeners. Actually, just watch Tombstone. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter if you want to know. Just watch it. Even if you've already seen it. I, I did watch the movie, and I liked it. It's it's pretty good. Uh, there's a lot of... We, I'm sorry. We're sorry. <laughs> we're just, pick your yeah. We're going to spend a whole episode talking about Tombstone. Here. <laughs> what do you want on your Tombstone? Judge? This series has an additional episode that's just titled Tombstone. Tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> Amelia. It wasn't our fault this time, you guys. We did it. Yeah. No one ever texts me. <laughs> no, it was. <laughs> you never even put your phone into silent. <laughs> just, that's I'm pretty sure it's off. I got it on full volume. I just don't have any friends. <laughs> I don't want to text these guys. They just say mean things to me. <laughs> Shut up, Alex. <laughs> You're too tall. They can do You're that in person tall. right now. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, you know, we say it mostly in jest, yeah, I think. Mostly yeah. in jest. <laughs> <laughs> I perfect, I, wow, okay, that was hard. What'd you say? I perf, I can't say the word. <laughs> Just say it here instead of there, you know? Yeah. Sit throughout work. We have an episode about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Can I plug my own show on my show? I, do it. I do listened it. to I that episode, Amelia, and it changed the way that I do character voices. So thank you for that producing awesome that. To hear. Thank oh, you. for serious? Yeah. I'm glad that like the whole episode wasn't just me being like, oh, James D'Amato. <laughs> no, <laughs> and there's... we'd be like, who is that? There's a <laughs> every time he talked about campaign, Ryan's like, oh, interesting, and I was like, oh my god. Yeah. Oh, that so sounds like a really cool character. <laughs> <laughs> like, I have no idea oh. who you're talking about. <laughs> like we spent, yeah, we're way too big of fans of campaign. I think we specifically it'll get released eventually, but we did an all clones game. Which we'll put out there at some point. That was cool. That was cool. Hey, I've listened to the That's first awesome. two episodes of Campaign. I, I'm almost caught up. <laughs> <laughs> Only 97 more. <laughs> and we could all tweet about it, but he would never know. Right, you I know. know. <laughs> uh, okay. I'll just tell him we were trashing have him to in person. Listen to this podcast, and then we can talk crap about him here. <laughs> I almost swore, and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> So I think I want to do, where did it go? I was like, oh, like, I'm ready. And then I'm not. <laughs> Sorry, Ryan. How loud is that? How, how, hey, guys. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. How loud is that to you guys in the background? I don't, I don't, I don't hear, hear anything. anything. Perfect. Cool. This happens a lot where I'm super paranoid about background noise. And then I actually listen to it and there's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. I'm sorry, I interrupted every the whole flow. I don't know, Caleb. Why would we know that? I should know, <laughs> but I don't. I buy my whiskey by the barrel. <laughs> it's a lot of it's a lot of whiskey. Listen, okay, you can buy a barrel of whiskey at Costco uh, for three thousand dollars. Where's okay? the nearest Costco? So <laughs> in the weird west. So let's say a bottle of whiskey is. My ex works at a Costco. We can ask him. How much? Like, oh, good call, dude. On his way home. That's a good call. That's not a bad idea. 
<laughs> be like, hey, you have $3,000. Can you pick me up a barrel of whiskey on your way home? No reason. You While you're dropping off those juice boxes for we the kids. We have to adjust for inflation, though. That's the thing. This is a Costco in the Weird West. Yeah, let me let me show you out here. I'll move my webcam around. You can yeah. do screen I sharing, could, you know. This is so much <laughs> Wait, we're we're, we're invested now. That's beautiful, beautiful buckboard right there. Look at that waveform. Beautiful. Yeah, Lovely. that's what I was looking at. I hope you just leave all of this in real time. <laughs> just lots of dead air. There's yeah. no editing. Get Pages rid of the background flipping. noise and just leave it. <laughs> Don't you know that's what we do for all of our episodes? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this one's just really bad. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, <Thanks>. pretty tight. <laughs> oh man, this is never gonna guys. make it to air, guys. <laughs> None of this, this entire episode is trash. Sorry, say it again. Way to go. Sorry, that's with right. this whole time. It's fine. I'll probably cut this whole section anyway. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah, we just spent wow. thirty minutes. By this like... section, he means the last hour. Yeah. <laughs> just page flipping. Delete, delete, delete. <laughs> yeah. Jedi, stop it. Jedi, come here. Stop. Who about these dogs in here? I know. Jeez. These recording conditions. And also the animals. <laughs> <laughs> Zing. Can you can you milk a mule? You can milk anything with nipples. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I set you up for that one. That's a wrap. <laughs> Well, cool, guys. What's All next? Right. Yeah, what so now next? I'm pulling up the outline document. Sorry, I'm right still here. stuck on strength. <laughs> <laughs> but not dirge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm Cameron Reed. I play Harper on Sounds Like Crows. Um, you can contact me on Twitter, uh, at CJReed322. Where is it? 211. Did I just botch that? Uh-oh. It's 211. It's 211. Uh, or you can just listen to their show and people will know. They'll just all know at once that you're listening. Yes, I I definitely it. check our statistics about every 30 minutes, so that's <laughs> probably true. <laughs> I've been really good. I haven't checked them this week. Wow. wow. That is impressive. <laughs> Dang. I know. I'm really proud of myself. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I come from a Heroes Unlimited background uh, from the Palladium role-playing system. Not a sure... I'm not even familiar with that system. Yeah, to be honest with you. With We're going to be covering uh -uh. it sometime soon. Um, well, character creation in that takes about four hours, give or take. Ryan, we have a rule. Core book. Okay, no. <laughs> so thank goodness for that. But there's still like hundreds of superpowers to choose from, um, which is just ridiculous. Which is Can I make a character that like only has super lame superpowers? <laughs> oh yeah, there's definitely a lot of super lame superpowers. I just have like really good hearing. Yeah, that, that would that. be dope. I can summon bees, but I can't control them. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the worst. <laughs> oh, oh, who let oh. Kevin in the also, room? I'm Kevin, no, not your bee guy. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Oh my god, what's his name though? Oh, what's your superhero's name? The, the suicidal yeah. bee? Something like the Crimson Stinger, I don't know. <laughs> no, it's just like the bee the team. Bee. <laughs> oh god. Well, they've got insanities in the system too, so you could have a phobia of bees. Yeah. Ooh, no, you, so and you're, you're scared of, of your own bees. That's what I said. I think you should yeah, like be allergic to them. But you can Those summon Or like maybe fire ants. Oh god. Alright, so we're going to be recapping our characters at the beginning here. Cool. Uh, so just make sure you have a little bit of a recap of who you made the last episode. So remember what we did 10 minutes ago? Excellent. Mm, yeah. Hard. Uh, it's yeah. going to be difficult. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> I know. It's, I can't get over a guy now. <laughs> Could that be my new character? Can we start over? <laughs> to like... Last episode, I created Regroup. a superhero that can summon bees. <laughs> but can't control them. But can't them. control them. <laughs> Also have I'm gonna have to make that now. You know that. I'm gonna ruin this episode. That's now so I good. Do that. We have. Right. Uh, we always make a trap in whatever game we play, Alex and I, where it's just a jar of bees. It's just like an AOE. <laughs> like we had it in our D and D game. We jar of bees. Just a wizard with a jar of bees. <laughs> yeah, that's, what, that's what he did. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. 
If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like One Shot. The most fun way to learn about new games is to listen to them get played. Every week on One Shot, James D'Amato brings you actual play recordings with a talented cast of improvisers, game designers, and other notable nerds. Each month features a new group trying a new system, exploring a wide variety of genres. The stories are self-contained, so you can jump in anywhere, and it's a great way to discover new games. Discover the magic of RPGs with One Shot on your favorite podcast app.